Here we go. We are live in five, four, three, two, one. Welcome to W I I L to B podcast with your host. It's me, Yifa. Welcome, welcome everyone to WIIL to be podcast. As mentioned, I am your host, Yifa. And today's episode is number 11, and I will be introducing Dr. Angela G. Ray, who is a Kentucky native. She was a child of two public school teachers. And in her current career, she is a professor, but she became a professor after being a manuscript editor for a decade, and in her 30s, she pivoted to become a PhD candidate. She is the Associate Professor in Communication Studies at the Department of Northwestern University. She's won an Award of Excellence that was from 2010 to 2013, and holds leadership roles in the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs and the Graduate Program Chair of Editorial Board of Northwestern University Press, and she held that from 2017 to 2020. She's also written several books, one of which has won an award. And her latest book is about a debating society organized by young free black men in Charleston, South Carolina, just before the Civil War. These black men of the Cleonian Debate Society were legally free, but in the antebellum South, white supremacy, slavery, and legal constraints on black people made their lives quite dangerous. Today, we're gonna to be talking about that book and also Angela Ray's incredible journey to become a professor. <laughs> Circuitous route, maybe. Circuitous route, thank you so Sometimes much for being here. Sometimes it felt incredible. Sometimes, you know, maybe not so much, but got it. I also wanna just say quickly for the viewers that this is an interactive podcast. So please, any questions that you may have for me or for my guest, please chime in, any comments you'd like to make. I love reading the comments as the podcast goes along. So Angela, thank you for joining me. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Aoife. It's a joy to be here. I appreciate being invited. I, I should perhaps mention that this book that we're going to be talking about is in progress. I'm still writing it, okay? So I've kind of written the middle and I to write the introduction and conclusion. So figuring out the like the like how the whole thing fits together and tying it up real neatly is not where I am just now. So you're, <laughs> okay. you're, you're gonna, you're gonna get um, an experience of me talking about a something that really is in process, but a project I've been working on for several years and one that I'm really excited about for a lot of reasons. Well, and you've also written uh, an essay, a published essay, Correct about mm -hmm. the, uh, the yes, research. which I shared with you a few weeks ago, um, which was about that I've written a, a, a chapter in a volume of essays um, in 2017, and I was talking directly about the process of debating in this society. Um, I'd participated in a conference at Penn State University um, a, that was really about debate as it's practiced today. And my contribution was on a panel that was really about debate history. So I would the the audience for that chapter that you may or may not have noticed was really sort of about what what does debate mean and what can it do for people? And so that sort of <laughs> emphasis is was much more appropriate for that audience than perhaps, I mean, this book, I'm really trying to tell a story not only about, this debating society in Charleston that um, began in 1847 and ended in 1858. Um, so I, I have found really remarkable and detailed records of that organization. Uh, but I've also tracked uh, through genealogical sources and other kinds of historical sources. I've tried to track as many of these individuals as possible to see what became of them later in their lives. So. Uh, the story is set immediately before the Civil War, but it kind of extends into the really the rest of the century. And, uh, you know, there's there are things to be said about the effect on families as well. Can, can you give us a yeah. little bit of a history for uh, for me? I, I've read a little bit sure. about your work and I also did some research just so I could make sure I understood the time frame and what was happening during mm -hmm. the time that they 
uh, yeah. founded and ran this debating society. But what was anti? What is antebellum South? I sure. mean, that word um, was is so. For, uh, I just want to say that that word has has really been so confusing to me for so yeah. many years, until right. I looked it up, and I yeah. understood Greek that it's a uh, or Latin the Latin roots yeah. meaning anti-war. Or before yeah, war. Before. Pre -war. Mm -hmm. before war. Yeah, I might say that this question really comes up in my classes a lot. Um, students are often reluctant to ask it, but then finally, when someone will, they say, oh, yeah, I was wondering that too. I thought, yeah, you know, people just ask things. So I'm delighted that we're starting there. Yeah, the term is a Latin term, anti bellum, before the war. There's also a term post bellum which means after the war. Um, in American history, we hear the term antebellum much more often than we hear postbellum, but we, we usually hear the term antebellum to refer not just to before any war, but in, in the US context before the American Civil War. Um, it also, of course, has a connotation of a, the period of slavery, of legal chattel slavery. So that, that's, uh, you know, there's a kind of moonlight and magnolias myth that's associated in some parts of our okay. culture with that term as well. Okay, so it's a it's a fraught term even these days, right? But the the term in my work is a is the, the historical. I'm referring to the historical period. Okay, so before the Civil War. So it's we're we're thing the the sectional cri the the regional and sectional crisis largely over slavery is really heating up. And these young men are, when I say young men, I'm talking about the members of this debating society were mostly teenagers, um, some possibly as young as 11 or 12, up to people, up to people in their later 20s. Um, the organization occur, ran for about nine years. Um, many of these young, now these, these young men were free. They were, um, I haven't found evidence that any of them were freed slaves. They were in they or had been enslaved. This was a generation, of, although some of their parents had, and some of that generation before them um, had 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 direct experience of slavery. These young men mostly were that that a generation where their their parents had either had were either always free or had become free, um, and they had the benefit of um, clandestine schools, you know, mm -hmm. kind of secret schools where they were learning the, not only to read and write, and but also, you know, Greek and Latin history and um, you know, the kinds of, they, they were getting a grammar school education and perhaps a little bit beyond. Um, the young men in this group, I have found no evidence that any of them uh, went to college at any point. Although uh, uh, at least one sibling of one of the young men uh, went to the University of Glasgow um, in the very late 1850s. Um, historians who studied uh, education in the, in the South during this period have identified that individual as the only person that they can locate who during the antebellum period who, uh, who had a collegiate education. And that was not in this country. So I have a few questions. I, I want to uh -huh. backtrack and talk about uh, yeah, your, your, a little bit about your history. Sure. Because I find it in some ways connected to the book that you're writing. Because... Huh. <laughs> I, 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 do tell. I, <laughs> I, am, I am very interested in knowing what that would sound like. Golly. Okay. Because I find yes. it really... To me, it's really impressive that you... Mm -hmm after a decade of in one career, decided you were gonna go and yeah. do a completely different career. And one that is, is, is uh, there's no guarantee. There's no guarantee that you're gonna oh, become right. a professor after you right. uh, graduate with a, 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 a doctorate degree. And it's a quite yeah. long and, and arduous process. You know, you're, mm -hmm. you're going through eight years almost of- uh, not, not that long. Okay, okay. How, how many years, Fine. four? Five. Uh, five. I was in five my years. PhD program for five years. Yeah. Okay. So five that's, years. that's a while. It's still a lot. It's, it's still a, a lot of time. That's right. It's, and you know, you're you're. It's a lot of time to dedicate to doing something that you you don't have evidence that you're going to go into 
you're, you're going to get a job as a professor afterwards. And you were right. quite fine, I'm sure, in the in the area where you were before as a mm -hmm. manuscript writer, and you wanted to make this change. And, and I'm curious, how did you make it through? Oh. Um, and how and and how yeah. did you have the courage to take the leap to change? That's an interesting question, Yifa. Um, let me narrate just a little bit of the history of it, and then we'll try to get at the the how and why, because I, I don't have an immediate answer to that. Um, I I had my educational history was already pretty eclectic. So my I did an undergraduate degree. I did a double major in English and chemistry because I thought I wanted to be a medical doctor. But I like to read books and I figured if I majored in English, that, that would be part of the deal. So, you know, I would just do that. OK, um, while I was an undergraduate student, I, for a variety of reasons, including volunteering in a hospital one summer, I decided that maybe medicine was not really where my true passions were were located. Um, I, and I, you know, I also got a lot of, it, you know, the, the importance of encouragement, the encouragement of teachers and other people and parents and whatever the, the, of others are is really critical, I think, to our development. Um, I got a lot of encouragement from my professors in my English program. Um, I took some drama classes. They encouraged me to apply for scholarships that postgraduate scholarships. Um, I received a, a major fellowship and went to the University of London and got a master's degree in drama and theater studies. Then I was 22 years old and I had two degrees in three different fields and I really thought I need a job, you know, need to work, need to, you know, earn some money, kind of figure things out. Um, I, I did various jobs and then I got a job at the University of Georgia Press where I got really good training as an editor, okay, of academic books. And I, I got married, I moved to central Wisconsin, I continued to edit books for the press at Georgia and others. And, you know, I was reading a lot of stuff. I also was learning a lot of sort of the nitty gritty of how academic books were put together and what a good one looked like and what a not so good one looked like. And, you know, I was learning things just by the process of dealing with other people's stories about, you know, I thought about what what academic work could look like. And some of these things were beautifully written and really fun. And some of them were dry as dust. And I thought, all right, so what's the difference here? And how do you know what? So I was learning a lot. Right. And I thought, well, I really would like to do this kind of work myself. And I edited, it happened that I edited three books within one year in, I was doing 12, 15 a year. So three oh, of wow. my projects within a year were uh, from the field of rhetoric, which is not something I had studied, not something I had encountered, but it looked like a lot of the stuff that I had really loved in my previous degrees. So it, they, they were interested in how language works you know, which I had was, you know, from my English major, I was, you know, how does language function? How does language function in the world? Um, they were also interested in performance. You know, how do people present themselves to others? How do, so persuasion was is really a critical question in rhetoric. Um, and they were also interested in how things happen in the world, right? Not just thinking about how, but how do we affect each other? How does change happen? How do we, you know, what, how do, what are the characteristics of, of audiences and, uh, you know, as a speaker, what can I, what, what, what can I say that people will trust me? And what, what are the characteristics that I would bring to something that would make me trustworthy on a particular subject? And then what are the real challenges about, about talking about something because of what your audience is likely to think about you? These questions were, seemed really like my drama program and like my English program, but put together. And I thought, okay. wonder where I could study that. Okay. Yes. So I, picked the book that I thought was the best one. And I waited till I was done with my you know, professional relationship. And then I sent a private letter to the author and I said, look, this is the kind of background I have. 
I'm really interested in this sort of work. You know, what do you think? And this she, this woman wrote back to me with right away and really helpful, told me where the programs were that were near where I was living and gave me some good advice. Um, and I had kind of been intending to go back and do another degree. I was married to someone with a PhD and I was interested in the kind of was doing. It seemed fun to me. It seemed interesting. Um, I liked hearing about his teaching and so on. And so we made the decision jointly that we would live apart and I would go to, I was accepted at the University of Minnesota. And so we lived at, see the deal was we <laughs> I'll, we'll do this if you'll do it on time. Okay. okay. I was, uh -huh, <laughs> right. I was motivated. This is okay. You're going to stop earning money. You're going to go to Minnesota and do this degree as long as you finish in a reasonable period, which, you know, okay. You'll come back in the summer. We'll live together in the summers and all this. So we, we, you know, I said, yes, that I, that I will do. Um, Truly, one advantage of going back to graduate school in your 30s <laughs> is that you know why you're there. You know that you've chosen to do it. You, you can identify what matters and what doesn't so much. You say, well, fine, th these are hoops I'm jumping so that I can get to this thing I want to do. You don't have this crisis of confidence that so many people have in their early 20s. Like, what am I doing? Is this the right thing? Should I be here? You know, I counsel students through that that crisis moment real often. And I've noticed that when I had and I have students periodically who start their program, so start a Ph.D. program in their 30s. And I recognize it. They are they know what they're doing, you know, they know what they're doing. You they don't worry if you say, you know, you really need to do this piece of writing again. They don't say, oh, what does this mean about me? They say, mm. OK, mostly because they've had jobs, you know, and have yes, had yes. had critique and un can kind of set. It's, it's a learning process yeah, to learn yeah. to separate the work from you as a human being because you really do invest yourself in it but you know people are trying to help you make you 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 know help you communicate your ideas to someone else and that's yeah. the you know that's you understand what they're do what your teachers are doing that's For a sure. long way around um i i i was partly i you ask about courage um i was eager for some, to try something new um, mm -hmm. And I had the support of those around me. You know, I had the support of my spouse. Um, my my father helped me financially a bit through that period to, you know, make it feasible to operate two households and so on. So. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you brought up a lot of things that I think were um are similar to the debating society and you were you were like oh, I want to see how you drop these it, things. Oh my goodness. Okay. okay. So overcoming obstacles. That's a big yeah. one. You know, a major obstacle that they have to overcome was the white supremacy uh white supremacy legislate uh, rules and legal um requirements. Right. You know, they weren't you weren't yeah. supposed to be reading as a black person for instance, you right. know. And it, yeah, and it was it was uh, against state South Carolina state law for a free black person to operate a school. See, yeah, so that was an obstacle. Um, yeah. Encouragement uh, from the people in the community. I'm sure they were receiving encouragement yep. to continue going on yeah. and to up, uh, uplifting the race. Yeah, and uh, also Eva, I might I say, I, if you want an example of that too, they yeah. had these annual um, annual meetings where they would invite people in the community. So this would be their community. So the free black community there in this that would come and, you know, watch them, watch somebody give a speech or whatever. What you see from their written records of these events is that those were very much, you know, moments of real pride for the community for the and encouragement yeah. for these young boys. Yep. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing you mentioned uh, was um, financial help. And I know I, from the yeah. uh, essay that I read, they, for instance, had uh, people um, giving them money to purchase books. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. And furniture. 
uh, <laughs> interestingly, they own some furniture, which also suggests. So when I saw now, by the way, that what I'm using to know about there are I, I, there are two minute books. So they it, they kept minutes of their meetings. One of them is at the Charleston Library Society in Charleston. The other one is at Duke University Library in Durham, North Carolina. So um, the and I had, I noticed that it was these two minute books fit together. That it was the same people. It was so together. These records give a, a the story of from the inception of the group to its dissolution in 1858. So that's what I what that's what I'm drawing this information from. Right. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, it's very impressive. And we talked a little bit about um, this idea of uplifting the race, the talented 10th, uh -huh. just before we actually aired, you and I were talking about this in the yeah. um, the background. And I, can you explain a little bit about um, what that looks like for these young men when they are yeah. formulating this debate society and, and for what they're doing it. Like why, why debating society in a time yeah. when you can't, you're not even supposed to be legally able to read and write. Why, yeah. <laughs> why debating? I, right, that I have to, so I'm, I'm gonna answer this question by extrapolating what I suspect and what I know about educational practice generally at the time. So I had the reason I start that way is that there's nothing in these records that would answer that question directly. OK, mm -hmm. but debating in this period broadly across across races, across um, socioeconomic class, debating was seen as kind of central to education. OK, so especially for men, but there, there is plenty of evidence that young women in various parts of the country were doing some of this as well, okay? But debating was just kind of what a, a it was a, a, a useful skill that one, that uh, an educated person would possess. So what does, de what does debating do for you? I mean, what, what might that teach you? It would teach you some research skills it would teach you how to communicate with other people, how to convince people through your language, through your comportment, through your preparation. Um, it would teach you some things about analyzing an audience to understand what kinds of appeals are apt to be more and less successful with the people you're, you're speaking to. Mm -hmm. um, and it would also um, give you some skills in just responding off the cuff quickly. So you need to be prepared enough so that you might make your opening statement, but then someone else would say something else and you'd have to have kind of thought what they might, how, what, how they might be uh, countering you so that you could rebut and so on. So it, I, I also, so there, there's some skills, there's some skills that could be then deployed in other arenas of life in, in, um, work settings or in um, in church settings or in, in, you know, any kind of group, organizational, institutional structures, other sorts of societies, um, groups that you might be associated with or belong to. These are transferable skills. Um, there's also really the also the matter that I don't want to lose track of is I think this was fun. It was, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. it was, it was fun to we didn't have, get together didn't have and do <laughs> no, no Netflix, right? So it's, it, you come, you get together once a week or maybe once every two, depending, I mean, it, this changed across time, right? But it, when they it were kind of in the most intense period of the group, they were meeting every week or then, you know, every two weeks or every month, or and then they'd go back to every two weeks or whatever. But they were meeting regularly and, you know, getting together with your friends and doing something that required some skill and maybe you show off a little bit and you, you know, you, you develop a reputation among your friends for being really good at this or that. I mean, it's, it's, uh, th there's a camaraderie that's built. There's a, there, you know, there's also a, um, especially living in a context where so much of one's life is kind of overshadowed by significant oppression, then you um, could, you know, here you could, you can be, 
you, you can enact a kind of freedom. I, that was a, a kind of a question yeah. that I had too. What is it like to, you know, be a free because they were freedmen, but they yeah. weren't really free in some place, you know, in, in, in yeah. the grand scheme of things, they weren't yeah. really free. And maybe this did allow them to have some freedoms in secrecy though. It still had to be in secrecy. Well, see, they're acting free within the, I mean, within this enclave community, right? They're, they are performing the characteristics of freedom. They are acting independently. They are thinking for themselves. They are asserting points of view on all kinds of questions. You know, they uh, current events questions or historical questions or, you know, general sort of evaluative questions. They they're they're taking the posture of people capable of dec making decisions and capable of thinking through what a what, uh, a, you know, a reasonable conclusion ought to be and responding to uh, disagreement. I mean, sort of learning how to generate argument within a what was in this group a cooperative context and Does that makes sense and, i mean and it's outside, yeah but in, in the outside yeah. they could they couldn't have an argument with a, a, a person yeah. a white person of the same um right. socioeconomic stature they couldn't do that at all so this is a way to like you right. said assert your independence and your freedom to be able to yeah. be, think on your own and to have a debate yeah, and uh, what you find is that several, I, I've found good evidence that several of these men did deploy these same skills later on um, as adults in the immediate post-war period in just the kind of scenario you mentioned, in political context where they're arguing on behalf of African-American people in the South um, against white elites. And this is yeah. in Reconstruction, which is yeah. a... Yeah. And can you kind of explain and, how they were then able to do like what was reconstruction? And then it's it's a brief period in right. history that didn't last very long. Yes, that's correct. Um, I'm referring particularly to the period in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War where federal troops are still occupying the South and black men are, are voting and freedmen and and free black men who have always been free. So we're not talking about women voting here at this point, but black men are voting, they are holding legislative office um, and have have uh, have some power. It's also a period where there are, I mean, it's a, it's a fraught and difficult period where there, there's all kinds of tension about who will be in the ascendancy in the South eventually. Um, and how is land going to be allocated? And what are you going to do with all these buildings that you, that the federal troops have have, um, have occupied? And so who gets them? Are you going to have so if, where you can, for example, can you have uh, schools for black children? Um, there are you know we, we, there are all kinds of uh, political issues having to do with the immediate aftermath of the war, uh, which then ends abruptly in uh, in 1876. That's I mean. Historians would argue whether it actually ends abruptly or whether, you know, it, it kind of ended even before then. But uh, the presidential election of 1876 is typically marked as a major ending point. Federal troops are removed from the South and then you get um, reinstantiation in many cases of, uh, of white supremacist leadership. And, and the suppression power of black dynamic. voting, the power yeah, dynamic the changes. power changes now, again. Yes, again, until the 20th century, right? But what, what, what these young men, several of them were really major players during the Reconstruction era. And having that yeah. debate society that they founded and ran for a decade, you, you would say, you would argue that that helped them to be in position then to... Yeah be uh, in political office? Yeah, and the skills, right? They had skills in order to do, to uh, to articulate views um, in, a, in a way that would be legible and easily followed by um, everyone in the community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, now you realize Aoife, it, it's, it's <laughs> always fancy and difficult to say that's the variable that really mattered, you know? I, mm -hmm. 
I, I don't, I'm real, I'm hesitant to, I mean, it's easy to say that orally, but boy, I'm way more careful than that in writing. <laughs> okay. Um, we've got it. So what I would say is that I can demonstrate that these young men were involved in a debating society and I can tell you what kinds of questions they argued and I can tell you how they kept their records and I can tell you how they organized themselves and how they changed their rules every five minutes because you know they 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 were so they were running an institution in which I that all evidence says that they were pretty invested okay what I then you know you say well all right 10 years later, five years later, 12 years later, 20 years later, you see, I, I then I can pick up tracks of a few of these people when they were doing other stuff. And you can, then you can, I can say, well, look there, that kind of thing that's happening there in that language that that, that person is argue, some argument someone's making at say in the 1870s or the 1880s, you say the, the characteristics of that remind me a lot of what he was doing back when he was a debater. But they they all obviously there were other influences on these young men's lives, right? Mm -hmm. Many of them were very involved in churches, they were involved in other kinds of societies, several of them became teachers, they were they were readers, you know, they were exposed to a lot of influences. So I think I think we have great records of this debating society, which then makes it possible to to project probable influence. I'll, I'll say that. <laughs> I love that but, probable influence. Yeah. I just want to stop here and see if uh, watchers have any questions that they'd like to ask about the debating society or about Angela's life and how she got to researching this uh, really amazing time period of antebellum, <laughs> South Carolina, <laughs> Charleston, South Carolina. I am really curious of, I guess, um, the fact that they had, they argued 93 questions in they did. the time period that mm -hmm. they ran the society. What is the importance of that 93, if anything? Yeah, um, it's it's about 10 a year, okay? Okay. It's okay, so it's not a huge number. Um, I think what's most important about the, about the 93 questions is that we actually have records of what 92 of them were. Now, if you're okay. studying, if you're studying as I have tried to do, um, debate in 19th century America outside the context of schools and colleges. So you can find decent records of debating societies within schools and colleges because they had libraries and they kept some of them kept the records. Okay. The, it is remarkable to have records of any debating organization that is outside schools and colleges that is this comprehensive. So we know what questions they they um, debated and we know what the verdicts were and we know who got assigned to what um, to what position and so on. So we have a lot of information. Um, if you'd like a few examples. Yes. If you're yes, let's do a few examples. <laughs> I oh. want to know what they were arguing about. <laughs> yes. So there are some current events questions. Um, will the present war, now this was during the Mex the U.S.-Mexican War in 1847, uh, will the present war with Mexico be of any advantage to the United States of America? The verdict was negative. Um, two weeks later, was the United States right in declaring her independence? The verdict there was for the negative. Huh. Um, there was a lot of stuff about military history uh, U.S., European, almost exclusively. Can, uh, who can was we the surmise why they would have a negative or a positive? We, I, I can answer that question and the, the yes, uh, we can surmise. It is, in ante, I'm, I'm now self-conscious about the word antebellum. In the, <laughs> in the antebellum United States, okay, Debating societies would make render judgments 
in different ways. So basically the two options were what they called the merits of the question, that is which point in this question is right and true and good, or the merits of the argument. So what, which one, which side has done, has presented the best case? We don't really know how they were making their judgments. Mm. I, for reasons that would take way too long to explain, I can make a case that probably they were leaning toward the second. So which which debaters like were did the made the best case? The best. Uh-huh. Okay. So the 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 verdicts don't really we, we we need to be real careful about ascribing meaning to the verdicts. Yeah, yeah. Okay. The mm-hmm. verdicts may have simply meant that Enoch Beard was really a good debater and he was so prepared and ready. And his brother Simeon, who had the other point, was just kind of dull today and just not. I mean, I'm I'm hyping it a little, but we what we could they may that may simply mean something about the the you know the preparation or the skill of the young men who were speaking at the time. Yeah. I have they a couple also have, of questions. Of course. I have a couple of questions from the audience. Great. Wonderful. Chris asks, he says, it sounded as if rules were changed during the debates. Is that correct? If mm-hmm. so, why? And what's your take on that? Um, rules, rule. I wish I could talk to Chris about okay. So <laughs> the <laughs> it, it is the case that during the period that, so I've got nine years of minutes that I've transcribed and analyzed. Rules for how the society ran changed quite a bit during that period. Um, That's true. Rule, I, I don't know that rules would alter like during an individual instance of debating. I I don't have any evidence that that happened. Um, My take on the change, the frequent. Now, what did I'm I'm talking about rules about things like how often are we going to meet? What day are we going to meet? Um, What's the duration of a debate? Um, Ought somebody who joins this society be permitted to join another debating society also? One thing I learned from this minute that there were at least three debating societies that were quite similar to this happening at the same time. We have okay. only the evidence of the one. So there, I think that the my I, my take on the changing of the rules is a couple things. I think that they were quite interested in voting on things. They voted on everything. They brought. They made motions on everything. There was lots of participatory decision making. Um, I think that that I mean, if we're looking for examples where we might be able to say this group was behaving in ways that was offering them a measure of freedom within a a larger social structure, significant constraint, that's good evidence for it. Okay, so there's lots of participation in governance, in decision making. Um, I also think that they were flexible and adaptable about um, you know, things aren't working so well, or we now, we have a bunch of rules that we aren't. Yes, there you go. (laughs) We've got a bunch of rules that aren't, aren't really doing much for us and we need to clean up the the rule book. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I might also say that there are maybe two individuals in this society who seemed mostly to be the people recommending rules changes. We had a okay. few people with, you know, lots of interest in organization. Yeah. As, was that uh, the character, the main, the main character that um, that was in the essay? Uh, that, Simeon yes. Beard? Simeon that Beard. Simeon, Simeon Beard. He was the, Beard one was, of the founders. He was, yes, he was a founding member and he was involved until the society. He was on the dissolution committee. In the, I mean, they even disbanded by committee. So that's actually he was, one of the other questions is why did the society disband? Yeah, well, what they say is, and I might say that um, through these minutes, you would look in vain for specific examples of commentary about the, the larger social structure in which they were existing. 
the word slavery does not appear in 50,000 words. Emancipation, abolition, even the South, does, these terms do not appear um, in, in the minutes. But when they're disbanding, they say, owing to present political disadvantages, and the word political is underlined. Okay, the society is disbanding because the situation the, the, the situation on the ground for free blacks in Charleston in January of 1858 is too dangerous for them to persist. A number of these young men had already left the state, moved to Philadelphia, moved to New York. Um, they, they would continue to leave um, after 1858. Uh, several would go to New York, some to Toronto. Um, one I know spent the war years in the Bahamas. One became a tailor in Cleveland. Um, to at least two young men left uh, South Carolina, moved to New York City, and uh, apparently were light-skinned enough to pass for white. They joined the Union Army uh, within a week of the firing on Fort Sumter. So they had military careers. That, that yeah. question so was, it, it was, it was political. It was the political context and the, and they are explicit about that. Yeah. Do you consider that was, uh, that question was from Jamel and I am wondering, mm. my question you, is, is that um, when you say the political, does that, is that in the context of white supremacy, like in, in air quotes, white supremacy? <laughs> Or, of course, that, that also we're talking about kind of literal threats against life and pro health and property. And for example, legislative efforts, this, this did not pass in the South Carolina legislature, but there were several measures introduced to attempt to, to enslave the free black population. Wow. So wow. It, was, it was that type of threat that, yeah. So and that's during the 1850s. You see increasing legislative efforts of that type. So their sort of lives really were in danger. So yes, and so it's it's interesting to me that with that, I mean, you you cannot read these minutes and learn about that. You these minutes, they're so cheerful. <laughs> I mean, this is a that they, they really had. I really do think that they have made a place for themselves. I mean, and they're not talking to the white elites when they're writing the or the, you know, the poor whites or anybody when they're writing these minutes, they're talking to each other. You know, they are they are representing themselves to themselves and they're representing themselves as respectable and religious and rational and thoughtful and curious and intelligent and, you know, all of those kinds of characteristics that they valued. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. And so really only, uh, I guess there, I say only, there are two or three moments. There's that moment at the very end where they talk about, you know, we're, we're filled with such sorrow to think about disbanding our society because of present political disadvantages. Um, earlier on in 1850, um, the John C. Calhoun, who of course, pro-slavery, um, pro-slavery advocate in Washington, D.C. He died from Charleston. He dies. You know, they're bringing the body back to bury him in Charleston. That's unmentioned in the minutes, but there, there is this reference to something like, um, you know, our, the date for our next meeting will be such that many, many of our members will have, will be out of town. And I thought, so they're not that, clear on <laughs> there. No. Yeah. Okay, we'll be, I thought, why would you be out of town? I, so I thought, well, who knows? I'll look at the Charleston newspapers for that period. I think, oh, okay, Calhoun's funeral. You know, they're not going to get together and be, or be, even be in the city when all of that is going on. So, you know, that's the level at which you have to, it, they're just these dig really- deep. You kind have of, to dig deep. Yes, you do. And by the way, there were several fever epidemics in this during this period. And I, this is something that I mean, I would have been working on this during COVID right here in this room <laughs> in my house. Right. And the uh, you know, you hit the, the word epidemic appears a time or two, which I had, you know, back in 2018, I'm reading these things and whatever I'm this and that. And uh, last year, you know, I was I thought epidemic. Oh, <laughs> 
you know, <laughs> so I felt the need to go learn more about yellow fever. But, uh -huh. I, you know, I, I think the experience that, you know, that we are all in and have gone through was uh, illuminating. I mean, it, it, you're right that one's own life does, it sort of focuses your attention on some things and not others. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I can see that. I, I have a, um, you know, when people talk about white supremacy now in this day and age, yeah. And then when I hear, you know, white supremacy in the context of this debating society and antebellum, uh, the antebellum South, what what is yeah. the difference? Because this 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 whole white supremacy, the usage of that term, has become quite right. loose, I think, right now. And everything is white supremacist culture, white supremacist behavior, yeah. white supremacist. I Right. I, I should say, Yifa, that I haven't ever really attempted to track the development of, or usage of that term across time. What I would say is that's not a phrasing that I see too much in the 19th century materials that I'm reading. But I think the term is a, the term from our own time is appropriate because white supremacy was suffusing the culture in which it, that I'm studying north and south. It was but not marked as such so much, right? It was the way things were um, uh, in a lot of ways. I mean, and you do have, I mean, you have black activists who are calling it out and critiquing it mostly in the North in this antebellum period. Yeah. Interesting, interesting. Not exclusively in the North, but- um, uh -huh. Well, they know, probably could have powerful voices. Who, exactly. No, it, uh -huh. you, you do have powerful voices that are critiquing white supremacy in the pre-war period, but it's there. Most of the discourse that you read from the time is is that and is um, is naturalized in a way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't think that's an adequate answer, but that's kind of what I, I mean. Can maybe do it's, here maybe it's not something. Yeah. <laughs> maybe it's not something. <laughs> I mean, maybe there aren't really, you know, true conclusions that you could be can yeah, be drawn no. about what uh, the context of white supremacy was at that time versus what it yeah. is now. I mean, language evolves over time, yeah. you know, and the right. and, and it wasn't being used in that sense at that time. Right, and it is. Yeah, the, the I think that you could, you could tr you could undertake to trace the the usage of the term across time. That's not the project I've done. Mm -hmm. For sure, yeah. I get that. It's an interesting a, question, however. There are a couple, a couple of other questions we have. Yeah. Uh, Jamel asks, after your do doctorate, when you and your husband reunited, where did you live <laughs> and where did you work? <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. In fact, my husband had a, a one year sabbatical and came and we lived in a one bedroom apartment in Minneapolis, Minnesota for a year while I was working on my doctorate. I also, I, once I was done with coursework, I went back to Wisconsin where he was employed and we lived together while I was writing my dissertation. I was still under this clock, like you <laughs> and, and I don't know if he can hear me right now, but anyhow, I was still, I don't think you'd object to that. Um, I, then, I mean, kind of our agreement was if I could get a job somewhere where we would like to be that we, he would quit and we would move. Um, so I applied really narrowly and I, I worked at the University of Memphis for two years. Um, I grew up in Kentucky. My spouse is from North Georgia. Um, we, I, you know, I enjoyed working with the students at Memphis a lot. Um, I got the opportunity. I mean, when I was offered the job at Northwestern, it was a, you know, it was a, it was an opportunity to, um, advance my career in ways that I, uh, you know, was appealing, but I, it was a harder decision to leave Memphis than people think. Um, I, you know, I liked teaching in that community and liked working with those students a lot. Um, I was told by a faculty member at Memphis when I expressed this, said, you know, you'll find people who need you at Northwestern too. <laughs> I said, okay. <laughs> Thank you. I, uh, but that, was, that was your ability to be able to that, leave and go that forth was kind with my of blessing. It. I, I, I maintain good relationships with several people I worked with, so. Uh, but I've lived in I've lived in uh, Illinois for now eighteen years, which is a little wow, shocking a to realize. Time. 
That's not yeah. good. And you and your husband, uh, uh, what I found with a lot of people that I know who have gone through the same track that you have to get a doctorate and then become a professor uh -huh. is that often when there are two people who yep. are going into that career of being a professor live apart for long extended periods of time. Yeah, I know. It's surprising uh, we, that you both live together now. Well, I, I know people who, we, we made the choice not to, uh, that was part of this original agreement. <laughs> We're sort of interested in contractual things too, I guess. Um, we we uh, agreed that I would not only finish on time, but then we would live together and we would just make job decisions based on that, that we, and he has not worked as a professor since he's done other yeah. kinds of jobs. Um, because that was, we, we've chosen, I mean, we've made decisions together about moving and um, he's chosen to, you know, support me in this way. And, uh, you know, we're, I'm, Happy. I'm, I'm yeah. grateful. Yeah, yeah. We just had our anniversary last week. So yeah, I'm feel, looking at the wedding pictures, you know. I didn't expect to talk about this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this but, is yeah. all a part, to me, to me, think these things all come full circle, you know, uh -huh. when you're talking about challenges that people overcome, decisions that they have to make. And if you look back at the, at the debaters, they had challenges they had to overcome. They had decisions they had to make. And the decisions that they would make would inform the next year of the debate society, the next two years of the debate society. Mm -hmm. And I think that our looking at our own lives and then going back and looking at something historical, there are um, yeah. some really good conclusions that uh, that can be made. Okay. I also want to ask you if there is any connection with being from Kentucky, do you, mm. do you consider that to be the South? Um, it's a weird spot, but it, <laughs> it was, there are, I mean, it, as a point of information, there in, in both the Union and Confederate flags, there is a star for Kentucky. Okay, there's a mm -hmm. represent. So it was, it is a border state, truly. Um, it was a, it was a slave state. So it, okay. it has that kind of, of uh, of heritage as well. Um, it's one Kentucky historian said that Kentucky is the only state that sided with the winners until the war was over and then they considered themselves, <laughs> which, you know, I think is both funny and sort of sad and whatever. Um, yeah, I, what, what was the rest of the sentence going to so be? The rest of yes, the, the rest I do of the consider question. Kentucky the South. Okay, so when, when doing research, Yep. on this debate society and the South. Yep. Do, are there any things that you are able to understand differently because you're from the South and you have Southern sort of yeah. um, influences? I'm not a South Carolinian. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I think is uh, is true about the South is that it's a, it's a large area and there the parts of it are not, um, are, you know, there, there's a lot of variation um, when I, I have had colleagues ask me, so, you know, when you've gone to South Carolina to do research, people hear your accent and they wreck. I said, no, 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 they, uh -uh, uh -uh, no, that is not what happens. They hear my accent and not, they know I'm from way somewhere north of them. Okay. And I say, you know, if I have to whip out the faculty ID, they figure that must be Illinois. Okay. It's no, it's, I, I, you know, I, I'm being, I'm trying to be funny. Heck, that's what I'm doing. It's, it's hard to know. You know, I think that it is certainly the case that having grown up where I grew up, sounding like I sound, especially that, you know, my students recognize me as Southern, both the ones from New Jersey and the ones from Louisiana. Okay. That's all. So th the fact that I am from the South is talked about a lot in my presence because I don't sound like most of the people who are teaching them, okay? Um, I, I go to the restaurants and people will ask me where I'm from. I mean, it's really <laughs> frequent. So I have to think about that a lot. And, but I do think, you know, I don't know. 
whether it, how it affects, I mean, I just don't know how that all, I've lived in the North a lot. I mean, I've lived in Minnesota and Wisconsin and Illinois, and I've been here longer than I was ever there, but I don't, I, you can, the voice is what it is and my heritage is what it is. Um, I'm, I mean, my family were ex small farmer agricultural workers in, uh, in the Western part of the state. Um, my parents were each the first person in their families to go to college. The fact mm -hmm. that that was possible for them meant that, you know, all kinds of educational opportunities have been possible for me. Um, mm -hmm. My dad was in the Navy during in the 1950s and the GI Bill made it possible for him to go to college. And so I, my my interest in education stems from my parents mm -hmm. and the fact that I really loved school all the way along. I loved learning about whatever. I mean, I was up for learning, you know, whatever was on offer. I was interested, um, but I was taught that way, right? I was taught that way at home to be curious and interested. I think it's the case that, you know, a lot of and this, this book is much more explicitly about, uh, about blackness and, and freedom and efforts toward freedom in a context of white supremacy than other work I have done. But I've been interested in the dynamics of race and gender um, always. I think, and I, you know, some of that certainly becomes with, comes with being, being American and also being, uh, you know, from the, the place that I am. That's a long oh, that answer. That was so, that was that was a good yeah. that was a good answer okay. though. That Thank was you. really good. I love Thank that you. answer. I feel validated. <laughs> we are closing up. We're nearing the hour, I and I, I'd like to know if there is anything that you would like as a last information to share about the De oh. debate society. You did have a print that you might want to show of their handwriting. Oh. So listeners might know, Yifa sent me a list of questions that, <laughs> my goodness, gracious sakes, I mean, pages and pages. Well, it's pages because we were talking about this before, too. She, I, I'm a preparer. I over prepare. I am so prepared for all of those questions. I could, And we've talked about other stuff here, which, you know, I think we've done OK. But one of the questions was why it is important that we look at this group's um, methods of documenting themselves. And I, so I printed out. Let me see if I can show this. This is oh, yeah. a it's a photograph of uh, one of the pages of these debating club minutes, okay? It says continued proceedings of the Cleonian Debating Society, and then there are minutes of the meeting of September the 22nd, um, 1851. Um, Yifa was interested in knowing about this, by the way, this photograph comes from Duke University Library. Um, she was interested in knowing about why are you put so much emphasis on their documenting. And a couple of things. I mean, I think that uh, the fact that they documented their 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 work meant that we have access to their history. So it was it was an archiving process. But I, I also would say that studying the way that they documented, the way they wrote, led me into learning things about the history of handwriting and I uh, about the kind the, how that too is a is a performance of a, a skill that could be deployed in other contexts, in work contexts, as a clerk, as a pastor, as a legislator, as, you know, someone who would keep records for, in one case, the young man kept records for a military organization, for churches, and so on. Um, I, it, um, I think that, that the fact of the, do, the, of the material evidence we have of this group um, is really uh, is really critical in thinking about you know, who they were and what we can learn from their history. I did a better job of that question earlier, but anyway, <laughs> but we, <laughs> we we practiced this one before we turned on the camera. <laughs> I promise it was far more eloquent an hour ago. No, that it's, was great. It's, that was it, I mean, actually, I, Jamel, Jamel says awesome. She loves. Thank that you, picture. Jamel. J and Jamel, may I thank you for your questions? That's the, I've loved hearing your questions. <laughs> okay, so we are nearing the hour. Angela, yes. is there a way that um, people could uh, 
see or find your books if they wanted to read anything that you've written? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, you, the, uh, probably if you want to look at what I've written, the Northwestern University website would be that just go northwestern.edu. If you type in my name as it's printed here, Angela G. Ray, it'll open a faculty page. My curriculum vitae is uh, clickable through a link and books are listed there. Um, and th there is, there's also on um, the University of Utah's website, if you wanna read more about this project per se, if you just go to Google and type green oasis in the history of my life, Angela G. Ray, you'll get a hit at the University of Utah and you'll see the text of a lecture I gave there in 2014. I know more about the group then than I do now, but there's there's a text on the web that I found today. I thought, wow, gee, they put the... the <laughs> can okay. you repeat that again, just in case I somebody can. wants to, to look for it? Yeah, sure. Green Oasis. Probably Green Oasis, Angela G. Ray will get it. But... Green Oasis, Utah, Angela Chiray would certainly get it. The, yeah, the, the Department of Communication at the University of Utah extended me a wonderful invitation some years ago, and I did a thing. We're at the end of the hour. Thank you so much, Aoife. It's been really <laughs> so, fun. I am so appreciative of having you to uh, talk about this debating society and explaining what antebellum means and talking about your own history and how ch you were able to make this courageous change in your life without your husband for a period of time. <laughs> Very courageous. And I want to, for everyone watching, I want to tell you that the next show will be airing August 31st, and it will be with interview with Damon Brown, who is mm -hmm. a four-time TEDx speaker. He is oh. a <laughs> several-time best-selling author, and he will be talking about how he has be become such an amazing TEDx speaker, how mm -hmm. he was able to have all of those four TEDx speaking engagements and write best-selling books. So tune in 8.31 at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. Thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate you listening in every time. Have a good night.